faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology Podcast. Today on the show we have Ryan DeBell from The Movement Fix uh, and he's very passionate. He helps people become strong and pain-free and take uh, ownership of their bodies and he has a very different outlook on how the body should move and how you should take care of it and to be honest, we have a very interesting conversation that spans many different areas from entrepreneurship uh, to taking control and taking ownership of your body to nutrition to all sorts of different things. Uh, Ryan is a very interesting guy who has his hands in a lot of different areas. Uh, so definitely listen to this one. You'll get something out of it for sure. Uh, so listen to this one beginning to end. Um, and before we hop into the podcast, I do want to urge you again, head over to the three fitnesscom sign up for the newsletter, and we're going to hook you up with all sorts of awesome stuff like our seven day barbell in doc program. So if you haven't already, Uh, Go sign up if you have. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, guys. All right. Without any further ado, here is Ryan DeBell. All right, Ryan. I'm super pumped to have you on on the podcast, man. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man, and I know all the listeners are looking forward to what you have brought to the table today uh, because we start with a fitness challenge, mental toughness challenge, and book recommendation. So I'm going to throw that at you right here at the beginning. Can you give us a fitness challenge for the listeners? Yeah, so um, I, uh, I I strongly believe that every human being should move all of their joints every single day as like one of the first things that they do in the morning. So... I put out a, uh, a video and like a, a guide thing that goes along with this on how to systematically move every joint every day. So I would challenge everybody to go either watch that and, and do it for 30 days because once you get out of bed and you go start, you know, doing whatever you do for the day, like there's something powerful that happens when you, when you spend time like feeling your body and moving it around in the morning. So that would be the, my, I don't know if I'd call that fitness, but it's like a movement challenge. Um, mental toughness. I think this can be very powerful. If you write down what your weekly goals are and then you look at the, that list and go, what the hell is stopping me from getting all of this done today? And I think that a lot of times we don't set ambitious enough things. We go, well, I could do this in the week, but why can't you do it all today? And I think people will be very surprised if they think that way, how much they are actually capable of. And then my book recommendation, uh, there's probably like 50 books that I really love, but uh, one that's kind of a, it's a fun and short read is called The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, hopefully, not, I don't know if anybody's ever recommended that before, but um, it's like a, it's like a parable more or less, but uh I think there's some good lessons to be learned from uh, richest man in Babylon. Awesome, man. I I, uh, I have been – that book has not been recommended on the podcast. I've had it recommended to me, uh, and normally I kind of check mark how many recommendations I get on a book, and then once it hits mm-hmm. like two, three, it, it moves up in the queue. Because <laughs> like, on Audible, I have like a wish list of probably like 200 books, and I'm like, well, I'm set for like another couple of years here, and so I just got to move around that wish list. But I, I really appreciate you uh, dropping all the, the challenges and recommendation there. Yeah, absolutely. Do you do you like audiobooks? Uh, I do because uh, I can power through them at yeah two uh, x speed. And then what happens if I really fall in love with an audiobook? I order the paperback or hard hardcover, uh, uh-huh. and then I reread it um, while listening to it at the same time. Um, if that makes oh, sense. In, oh, yeah. huh. It's supposed to I like could, I, uh, triple your comprehension. Um, like and, if you read it while you listen to it. Yeah, and retention because you're you're seeing it and you're hearing it. Um, and so that's kind of my process right now. How do you feel about audiobooks? You know, I really wanted to like audiobooks. And I just, I don't know if like my brain doesn't work that way or I, have to, I need to like train myself, but uh, they're really hard for me to get into. Like I could sit down and read like an actual book for like four hours straight and be completely focused. But I listen to an audiobook for like 15 minutes. I'm just, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I don't know. It doesn't work for me. I should try the reading and, and listening though. That's I've never heard anybody doing that. So that that uh, I'll have to give that give that a try. Yeah, try with one of your your favorite books or maybe one you don't because the main thing like I'm going for there, like I said, is that retention, trying to retain as much as possible. And yeah, 
Like I, I just flew from uh, San Diego back here to Dallas. And I mean, I, I went cover to cover on a book uh, on the three hour flight. Uh, Cause if you're listening to it to two X speed, it's a six hour audio book. You're done, you know, on, on one flight. So it's a, uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, maybe I'll try the double X speed. <laughs> yeah, hey, you work up to it. Work up, you go one point five, then two. Um, all right, man. All right. So let me uh, the the listeners. Uh, some of them may not even know who you are yet. So let me give you a minute to kind of introduce yourself, tell a little bit of your story. So uh, who is Ryan DeBell? <laughs> yeah. So um, what I do currently is. I, I run a my website and blog and workshops, which is called The Movement Fix. That's also the name of my clinical practice. So I'm a sports chiropractor out of Seattle, Washington. Um, but I do a lot more than just that. So as a little bit of a backstory, um, I went to a business school at the University of Washington, and I studied primarily the management of technology, like information systems. And as I went through like internships and things like that, in that program, I decided that I wanted to pursue something more in the healthcare field so that I decided to go uh, to the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon, which is where I graduated from uh, with a doctorate in chiropractic and a master's degree in uh, sport and exercise science. After I finished there, I moved back to Seattle. I opened up a clinical practice uh, up north, like maybe 30 minutes north for those who are familiar with the area. And uh, so I see people one-on-one there during the week. And then many weekends out of the year, I travel to uh, different places to teach uh, the workshop that I teach, which is like a full day event for clinicians, trainers, and coaches. So I've been doing that for about three and a half years, the, the teaching workshops thing. And then more recently, I've begun expanding a little bit into the uh, sort of entrepreneurial or business side of things uh, as well, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, shortly, but that's primarily what I'm cur- what I'm currently doing and a little bit of background on myself. I'm very into the, uh, I've been doing CrossFit myself since 2007 with like kind of like off and on, like I'll be very about it for a while and then I'll want to do something else for a while and then I'll get back into it. But that's something I've been doing for about 10 years now off and on. So uh, yeah, there's my background. Awesome, man. Love it. And there's one big question that comes to mind after you kind of give me the breakdown. And so we have, you have a clinic, you have uh, a podcast or two. I think it's two podcasts, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, two podcasts. Yeah, the, then you have the Movement <laughs> Fix website. Uh, yeah. You have the Daily Domination Journal, which I'm going to talk about, which um, we will in a minute. But I want to just say, man, like you have a lot going on. How do you manage to fit all of that in? Oh, I also have a website called movementproviders.com, oh which uh, which we'll talk about later. And uh, movementproviders.com is a uh, it's a listing website for healthcare professionals and uh, trainers and coaches to list their business. So, uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that later too. I um, I have a lot of virtual help. Let's put it that way. So. Um, I try to delegate as many tasks that don't require me personally as possible. And I'm trying to be better at that. It, it is certainly not something that people are like comes naturally. So it's something I've had to work on developing quite a bit in myself. And, uh, I have a lot of ways that I, that I try to get more stuff done in, in less time and really the more, the most important things done. Uh, so one of the things that I've been recently doing over the last maybe three to six weeks, but I've been kind of fine tuning it, um, which has been proven to be extremely effective for me is, uh, I've been working in uh, 30 minute blocks where, where 25 minutes is work time, very focused work time and five minutes is, is break. So I've been using an app for that called be focused. It's kind of like so a go- Pomodoro timer, right? That- uh, yeah, I think it's a similar concept to that. So yeah, is that 25 on five off? Uh, I, yeah, I believe it is. I believe something it is. like that. Yeah. It's actually, in, it's incredible. So I have this app on my phone and all my computers. So I just run it and I go full screen. I turn everything off. And, uh, so I cycle through that, but more importantly than doing that is at the beginning of my day or the night before I'll create a schedule of all of the, the, um, the bottlenecks of the projects that I'm working on. So let's say I'm let's say I have three things going on that like that are holding up the progress. 
I will schedule those into large time blocks and then those time blocks are broken up into those 30 minute cycles. So I know exactly what I'm trying to accomplish during those specific times. Um, it's extremely easy to sit there and do random stuff and never actually get anything done. So knowing that next critical step and then scheduling it, I don't do to do lists. I do scheduled tasks and a to-do list is like the easiest way to get nothing important done because you always want to do the easiest. Like you'll scan the to-do list to find the ones that are easiest. And the ones that are easiest probably aren't the ones that need to really be getting done anyways. Um, so like I'll schedule a block to just get random tasks done, but then I'll schedule real blocks to get the hard things done because I know when the time gets there, I go, look, this is what I got to do. It's in the calendar. It matters now. So I'll schedule my workouts. I'll schedule meals. I'll schedule all of those things to make sure that I follow that. And it, it kind of changes on the fly to some degree, but that has been the, that's been the change I've made recently. That's had the biggest impact on, on things. It's like 300% of my productivity. Yeah. And you, um, you seem like a kind of a productivity, uh, junkie, much like myself, which is awesome. <laughs> and I discovered your daily domination journal. Did this come out of your desire to be as productive as possible. Yeah, it's funny. I'm talking about these time blocks, looking at my daily domination journal right now where I wrote up my blocks for today. Um, yeah, so I co-created the daily domination journal with my colleague, uh, Dr. Anthony Gustin, who I went to uh, chiropractic school with. And he has also, he's the co-host of the uh, the Health Fit Business podcast, which is the, the podcast that I do that's the um, like business oriented one. And uh, we were spending some time together and, and realized that there's a lot of great journals out there. Um, journaling has been around for a very long time. Um, but what we found was that no journal had like all of the things in it that we that we wanted in terms of like expressing gratitudes, like setting your mindset right for the day, but then also like actually getting hard things done and asking yourself hard questions and really doing a lot of self-analysis and not like self-analysis like am I happy, am I sad, but self-analysis are like what do I really want to be doing and why am I not doing it and what are all of the things in my life that I'm doing that I need to completely get rid of and what are the things that I, I really want to start doing and it's very it's actually somewhat uncomfortable to go through the beginning of the book because you, you force yourself to ask questions that you've probably been avoiding for quite some time. And then the other thing that we have in, in the daily domination journal as well is, um, a routine builder. So as you know, the power of routines is incredible because it, it puts productive things on autopilot. So they become somewhat effortless. So every week we have a, a routine builder so you can modify and tweak your morning and evening routines to try to hone in your own. A lot of times, what people run into is just go, I don't know. I don't know like where to start. I don't know. Like there's no system for them to operate inside of. So if you have these routine builders at the beginning and end of every week, it allows you to start experimenting with your own, um, with your own setup to fine tune it for you. Cause everyone will have things they like and don't like in the morning versus afternoon. Like I realized that I do not like meditating right away when I get up in the morning because it makes me too relaxed. Mm -hmm. And I prefer to do that more in my evening routine. And so, yeah, those are some of the things about the daily domination journal. It's uh, t all of the stuff that we've been implementing in our lives for the last several years and uh, put into a book format to, to try to, you know, help people get the things done that they want to get done. So the tagline is essentially like get more done in one month than you would typically get done in a year. Cause it's a one month, it's a one month book as it stands currently. So, um, yeah, the response has been really, really good. So, you know, we get emails all the time from people just telling us that, uh, how, how much more they're getting done and how far they're progressing on the goals that they've sort of been wanting to do, but never knew how to really start going after. Yeah, man, I think that's that's awesome. I, I love it when a product is kind of developed out of uh, you know one's own personal yeah. Uh, yeah, need and practice. You know, you're like I need this and no one has it, so I'm just gonna create it myself. You know, I think that's yeah. normally the best yeah. way to do things. That is the best. I mean, when you for a lot of listeners who are maybe they're thinking about something they they you know a business they want to start or a product they want to make, I think you hit the nail on the head that the best ones are make the things that you want to exist that don't. Like that's the best thing to do. No, I, I completely and, uh, agree. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, what we could do actually for your listeners is we uh, we can do a, a a coupon code for them. Okay. Uh, if they, if they'd like to get a daily domination journal, uh, and we could do. Uh, I'll make a coupon code better humanology 10 and that'll get them uh, $10 off the, the book. And it does, it does have free shipping in the U S sweet man. Well. I'll, I'll add that to the uh, show notes when this is published. Perfect. Awesome. And then they, yeah, I think the other thing we wanted to do was like make the, make the title of the book, something that makes you pumped up to do it. Like who doesn't want to dominate the day, you know, mm-hmm. wake up and just start crushing it. Uh, so that was, that's kind of where the name came out of, uh, and yeah. how, how long have you been doing that? The, the book yeah it, we we released it uh january 7th okay so okay so it's been about three it's been uh what january february february March. i think I, it's been about uh 10 weeks i guess okay very cool man and uh so you also are running a, a clinic is that correct yes yeah so i have my clinic space my physical location where i work with clients one-on-one um during the week so those are typically things for like sports injuries rehab um the uh, quote unquote chiropractic work. Although I don't really practice the way people think of a, a chiropractor, um, primarily because of my, my background in like exercise. Um, I take a much broader approach to helping people because, um, I think one of the problems that happens is let's say someone goes to the, goes to the chiropractor. Like I can't assume that no matter what's wrong with the person, like cracking their joints are going, is going to help. Right. And and I think that that's one of the pitfalls is um, that would be like, you know, that'd be like going to the, your medical doctor no matter what, like they do the same thing. Like they give you an antibiotic shot for anything. Like you have a broken arm and they're going to give you a shot. So They can be I, that I, way I, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> sometimes it does feel that way. But um, so anyway, I just like to throw that caveat out there because I think there's a uh, in that in in the uh, in that field there's going to be a larger change um, where people start thinking more and more like that. So I try to lead. I'm trying to lead that charge as much as I can because I think it needs to happen for the uh, for the good of the uh, of the profession because it just doesn't make sense to do the same thing for every person no matter what. And uh, yeah, so I have like barbells and kettlebells and I mean like like 75 percent of my clinic is actually a gym I probably spend more time in the gym area than I do like in the treatment room because people can typically really help themselves and I think of what I do is I help guide them and make good decisions Um, I don't want people to rely on on me doing something to their body in terms you know like whether it's like soft tissue treatment or a um, joint mobilization or something like that I want people to know how to take care of themselves. So um, the, the one of the main operating like principles that I have is it's a fundamental human right for people to know how to move their body and to live pain free. So that's really what drives everything I do with the movement fix is people need to know how to do that. Like I think that that shouldn't be some secret knowledge. That should be widely available to know how to lift well, how to not have pain. And, uh, it shouldn't be this thing that is, you know, kept behind closed doors or you have to come see me for me to show, you know what I'm saying? So that's really what drives me to do what I do. So in terms of like why I do so much content for my podcast, or I make a video every week on my, on my blog, um, and the workshops and other things that I'm I'm doing with the movement fix is, is to fulfill that need, uh, because I really do believe that. And, and so you work with a lot of people. What is the, you know, you, one of your main, your missions, your goal is to make sure people are in the know, right? So what is the big thing that you see people not knowing basically? Like they, they walk in and they just kind of, you're like, oh wow, people don't know this. I think that, uh, that's a good question. That's a hard question. Actually, people come to the table with a lot of different backgrounds. So I think that one of the largest misconceptions is, People want to – I think people really uh, – they think that rolling out on a foam roller is like the answer to every ailment. <laughs> and um, and not to say that that's not effective. I think it is effective to a certain degree. But if you really think about like what it does, what rolling out on a foam roller does, um, there's a lot of things that it won't help with. So what I mean by that is, okay, you roll it on a foam roller, you're pressing – a piece of foam against your skin, your connective tissue and your, and your muscles primarily. That's what you're aiming for. Like, let's say you're doing it on your quad. Like that's what you're going to be smushing into. 
the things that foam rolling won't do is they're not going to affect the actual joint of your hip. Okay. So let's say I'm foam rolling my quads to try to improve my hip range of motion. You're going to get the muscles around that area to relax to some degree. That's what the foam rolling will do. It'll also warm up the tissues or the muscle, which can make it temporarily more uh, extensible. So it makes it, uh, it's sort of like warming up <clears throat> molasses and it becomes more like, you know, it flows more easily. Mm -hmm. So that's one temporary effect of foam rolling because foam rolling is very temporary. You know, people roll out and then they feel better and then it kind of like returns. Um, or you're just getting the muscles to relax. And I think that foam rolling and doing that, those kinds of things is a means to an end. And the end is moving your body frequently through large ranges of motion. So I don't think of it as being the end all, but it is, it is commonly thought of as being the answer for everything. The, but uh, I, I don't really think that's the case. It's a tool to help you move a joint through its ranges of motion. You know, uh, I was yeah. re reading a study recently. Um, and it kind of goes along with a lot of what you're saying. And it, it basically says like if, you know, a mobile joint uh, is a healthy joint and, you know, you're, I forgot the percentage, but the, like 89% uh, less likely to get something like arthritis if your joints are constantly mobile and, and healthy and moving. Um, so I, I kind of want to talk about your, your challenge at the be beginning of the podcast. Um, how do you recommend people move all of their joints? I know you probably have like a, that you said like full 30 days or something like that, but like mm. kind of give like, uh, maybe, uh, a synopsis of, of some things you recommend. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So to touch on that point, um, the, I have a video where it shows, I go through like how I would do it, but let me explain a little bit. So, uh, first of all, the reason that a mobile joint is a healthy joint is because the, a joint and the surface of the joint, uh, on the bones, it gets its nutrients from the fluid inside of the joint called your synovial fluid. And the more that you move a joint around, the more kind of like a pumping action there is of that fluid. So it essentially helps to nourish the surface of the joint. So like, that's what I mean by foam rolling isn't going to do that. It's not going to affect the joint in that way. Right. Uh, so, but if your muscles are tight, it might prevent you from moving the joint easily. So that, that's kind of what I mean by that. Now, in terms of what that would look like, I think about moving all of the major joints. So that would be your spinal joints, shoulder joints, hip joints, knees, ankles, wrists, uh, toes, fingers, and, uh, shoulder blades. I hope I didn't miss any elbows. Yeah. So basically all of the main joints, but the way I would start it would be, um, now there's, there's conflicting research here. There's research that would be like, oh, you have to move it, you know, 20 times or 30 times or hundred times to get a benefit. But, um, in my opinion, getting people moving around at some point throughout the day is so much better than not moving that if there's some particular number that some study showed, like I'm not going to get hung up on it. So I'd start with uh, cat cows which is like a yoga thing where you're on your hands and your knees and you arch backwards, then you round forwards as far as you can, uh, which is taking your spine into flexion and extension. And I'll do that for five to 10 reps. And then I look at rotation of the spine. So in the same position, you kind of scoot your butt back towards your heels a little bit and then twist, um, through like your rib cage, like you'd rotate your torso to the right, rotate it to the left. Uh, and then I'd look at the hips and I would do like a, uh, the, like a runner's type stretch where you're getting into hip extension on one side and getting down into hip flexion on the other side. Then there's like some rotation of the hip movements and then there's uh, shoulder movements as well. So kind of hitting all of those joints in what I attempted to do for that is get them in all of like the directions that they can go in as a way to like get things pumping in the morning, get it, get it going, you know, break the stagnation of sleep and uh, it's not a really aggressive thing either. It's more about the repetition than being really aggressive. So uh, I think of it not as like, I'm not, because the point of me doing that is not stretching the muscle. It's repetitively moving the joints. So maybe there's another misconception there. Like everyone thinks that rolling out and stretching is the answer. And I'm thinking more about like, how do I just repetitively move the joint around in order to get fluid exchange and get that kind of pumping action within the joint? Um, but yeah, that's essentially what it looks like. So that's what I do every morning as part of my morning routine that I have built in inside of the Daily Domination Journal is like, oh, and by the way, in the book too, there's a, there's a little box you have to check in the morning that says, did you do your morning routine? And that's such a, uh, <laughs> I'll start my book and I'll look at that box and go, 
oh yeah, I got to go spend 10 minutes doing some stuff before <laughs> I can even start my book. Like it's such a good self check. Do you uh, mind that's uh, what... sharing your morning routine? Yeah. So what I do is I, uh, it varies somewhat cause I'm still fine tuning it as I think we all should be, but I'll, I'll wake up. I do not check my phone until a lot of stuff in the morning. I think it's such a bad habit. Every morning I think to myself, like there's always a desire, you know, you want to wake up and see what's going on. But I go, look, these are the moments right here where either the day starts off well or the day starts off crazy. So I don't check the phone. I get up, I go, uh, go downstairs. I make coffee and then I will do my morning. I'll sip on the coffee and then I'll do my morning movement routine. And then I like to read for, uh, 15 to 30 minutes, sometimes up to an hour, depending on what the day looks like. Um, and then I'll, and then I'll, uh, then I'll do the journal and schedule out what I'm, what my day is going to look like. That's what, that's what my morning routine is like currently at the end of the day, my PM routine, I, uh, I try to stop working at seven. That doesn't always work because, uh, a lot of times I go to like eight or eight 30, but I try to stop it early. I've been trying to stop earlier so that the next day I'm more charged up to get going, but, uh, I'll close off all you know, like any sort of work type of stuff on the computer phone or whatever. And then I'll write down all of the things that are on my mind that I still want to get done as a running list of things that I need to organize for the next day. And that's when I'll do my, um, I'll do essentially the, the movement routine again at night and then I will do my meditation and then I will, um, make dinner and eat dinner. Um, so that's kind of what my PM routine currently looks like. Awesome. And so how long have you been, uh, pretty routine like that? Uh, over a year at least. And how would you say it's, uh, kind of changed from pre <laughs> pre person doing the routine, uh, should I say pre Ryan routine to yeah. post Ryan routine? I look back at myself like before I started doing this and it's like embarrassing, um, because it changes or so, I just go, man, I was so sloppy. And I hope I think that in a year from now where I look back, I'm like, remember when you went on, on the, the podcast and you talked about like you were really sloppy when you were on that podcast. Hey, I actually wrote, I wrote down this morning. Uh, I wanted to do this mental exercise that someone had mentioned to me, uh, of write down like all of the things that you've done in the last one year, uh, like the, in the last one year accomplishment wise. So I was doing that this morning. That's actually a really cool exercise to do because I think you've probably achieved more in the last year than you think you have when you actually write it down. Um, but I've done so many projects from nothing to completion. And, uh, the reason I say to completion is it, I used to be really good at getting projects 90% of the way done and then never actually because the last 10% is really hard. Oh yeah. Um, I'm sure you know, like I've been, so part of the reason that I've had to try to change so much stuff is Like six months ago, I had like seven projects I was working on that were all like 75% of the way done and none of them were getting completed. So I took all of them off the table except for one at a time and I just focused my energy on each individual one until it was totally complete, done. And that had dramatic, uh, dramatic effects. But what I've, in the last year, to kind of get back to your question, the last year, the things that have changed for me the most would be my work ethic and my, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, I'll think of it. My work ethic and discipline, that was the word I was looking for. I don't know why that was hard. Um, have increased unbelievably my focus and my desire to work hard versus do things that are fun and enjoyable. Not that work isn't fun and enjoyable, but, um, working hard and seeing success is much more enjoyable for me now. I've also read a lot more books this last year because I've scheduled it. It's one of the reasons I, I really enjoy scheduling things to get done because if I didn't schedule to read or know that it was part of my routine, there's no way I would read as much as I read. I think you have to intentionally set that into your day and make it something that you just, it's just something that you do because reading books and reading a lot of books, you can gather like thousands of years of people's experience and knowledge in a matter of hours. That's incredible if you think about it. You could take someone who spent 40, 50 years 
in experiencing their trials and errors and you can you can absorb that in eight hours that's incredible yeah man i think <laughs> i'm a big reader and i uh i wasn't always it wasn't really until i got out of the military a few years ago that i uh, really started uh, hard charging on the reading but man the I feel the same way from where I was a few years ago to where I am today. It's like you know, almost embarrassed of the person pre uh, pre doing all of these things, like morning routine, like you're talking about, reading regularly, all that stuff. Yeah, and, and when you start adding all of those things together and then you multiply that by time, the results are dramatic. It's the day in, day out. You know, if you think about accomplishing something if you think about your circumstances, your current circumstances, you can't really directly access your current circumstances. What you can access are the day-to-day choices and the day-to-day activities. And those are done via habit and and scheduling. So if you want to change your circumstances, rather than trying to directly change those, you access them through that route. And then you you know you do that multiplied by time and you have dramatic dramatic changes it's like if you wanted to lose weight you can't eat healthy for a week and expect that you could lose 50 pounds i think we have a similar similar thought with well if i do these habits for a week i'm gonna have these crazy results and that's just not true right you'll have have some maybe you'll lose you know in relation to that diet thing you'll lose 10 pounds or something in the first couple weeks but it takes a really long time for these changes to have the dramatic results. Like it's like doing meditation, you know, the first time I started doing meditation, uh, and I do guided meditation. I use the, uh, the headspace app. I, um, been enjoying that At, after the first week I was sitting there like, okay, this is not doing anything. <laughs> and then, and then I'm like, okay, look, just continue doing it for a month. And, uh, now I've been, I've been probably doing that for a year at this point. And, the way that I react to things has, I don't, I'm not nearly as reactive or I don't get upset with things as easily. And I think those are changes from the meditation, but it took a long time to make those changes. You know, there's some like rewiring. I started meditating actually a lot after I read the study when they showed that the, there was like actual anatomical changes in the brain Right. Yeah. Af- after meditation. I read that and I go, okay, I'm doing it. Like if they can show what the actual changes are, whether it's, you know, a change in biochemistry or a change in like the anatomical structure of the brain, I'm in. Yeah. And that's what, uh, that's typically how my brain works as well. And that's a big thing I push for, uh, people doing it. Yeah. We're mechanistic. We're mechanistic. We want to know the mechanism. Yeah. Like the, the Wim Hof method. I, you know, when I first heard about it, I didn't really know of all the studies behind it, the Wim Hof breathing method. And then once I read like, six different studies on it I was like okay I think I might start adding this to my morning routine and same (laughs) with meditation and uh, all these things and one thing I always challenge people to do if uh with the morning routine like you're talking about is like you just kind of have to like stick with it and it's the the routine compounded over time but like the biggest thing is making sure that it, it makes sense for the individual like you have a specific reason you're doing your routine and uh you know it's moving you a certain direction I have the same reasons for mine but what I I see people doing is you said you said like people do it for a week and it's not like they don't stick to it and i I see that all the time because they're trying to do ryan's routine or my routine and it's not their routine they need to make their own that they believe in and that they see will you know actually move them forward uh so how did you kind of piece together uh, your routine that you know keeps you motivated to keep doing it (laughs) um there's many mornings i don't feel motivated to do it and i and I just have to overpower that with like logic of that it's the it's the small choices that make the difference. Like you think about okay, if I I, I like to, I like to bring it back to diet because I think people can relate to that a lot. If I eat one piece of pizza right now, that's not going to make me fat. You know, it's just going to taste good, and then I'm going to be like, wow, pizzas taste good. But if I, if I made, if every time I felt tempted to eat bat poorly, that accumulates into like, you know, a year goes by and you're like, man, how did I gain 30 pounds? Well, it was all of those seemingly insignificant choices. And one of the ways that you can help with that is go, look, 
if I eat this pizza right now, these are the these are the things that lead to this or don't lead to this. So when it when the morning comes up and I go, oh, I just want to like not do anything because to say that I wake up every morning like, yeah, you know, I'm so pumped for the day. Like there's definitely days like that, but there's definitely days not like that. Uh, I have to remind myself doing this right now is what accumulates into what you're you're trying to accomplish. So that's kind of what the driving force is to keep me uh, motivated. But to I've just been tinkering around with it. You know, I didn't know how to do a morning routine when I started. I was just like, I'm just going to start doing stuff in the morning and see what I like and what I don't like and what makes sense for me and what doesn't. Like the meditation thing, I was doing that for quite some time in the morning until I realized that by the time I was done with the morning routine, I wasn't even motivated to start working hard because I was so relaxed. <laughs> but someone else, that that might clear their mind and get them like ready to work really hard and focus. So... I can't say that it's not right for everybody's routine as you were describing. It just for me, I like it at the end of the day when I want to clear my mind so I can just cool off, recover. You know, there's really there's really only three ways we can spend our time. We can spend our time being productive. We can spend our time recovering. And we can spend our time in the the terrible place between the two. So I try to be very intentional to never spend my time in the terrible place between the two. The terrible place between the two would be me doing this. I'm kind of relaxing, but I'm um, paging through stuff on YouTube, like reading people's comments on videos or something. Right. Or like that's not productive, but I'm also not relaxing at all. It's very not. And then you end up spending your whole day in the sort of quasi, like either uh, you're working hard or you're in this like quasi state and you never fully recover. And then after time, over time, you're like, you get smoked. So I'm either being very intentional that I am working right now or I am relaxing right now. And when I'm relaxing, it's like I'm doing whatever I want to do, like play Xbox. I don't care. You know, I was just reading a book on, I'm reading this book on Elon Musk right now, who is just a, such an interesting person. And they were saying at the end of the day, he goes and he just he just plays video games. Yeah, I love it when they break down some because, I mean, uh, you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. And so sometimes we try and model those who are more successful than us. Right. But, you know, it's a, it's a good, good strategy. But then sometimes, you know, and sometimes the people we model, they will be like they will have the morning routine. They they meditate. They do this. They, they do that. And the other. And then like occasionally they'll just bring in some billionaire who flips every single thing you've ever heard on that. <laughs> who's like, right. yeah, I don't really, I don't, I'm not that productive. I, you know, I focus for about four hours a day and then he's like, goodness gracious, you're just like on a different level of human being. And Elon Musk is, he is a different level of human being right there. That guy. Oh yeah. So I don't, I used to kind of feel guilty about, Oh, is playing video game. Like, is that, is that too lazy? But there's actually a lot of research to show that, it's uh, there's like brain changes that happen when you play games. And so that interested me and I just have fun doing it. It gets my mind off of work. And I think that's important that you have that mental downtime so that when you get to the next day, you're ready to go again. I, I couldn't agree more, man. All right, I'm going to shift gears on you here. Let's do it. All right, so say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented and the president calls you up and he says you're responsible for one chapter of this book. And so they're gonna this this book's gonna be in every single school in America. So every single child in America will have to read your chapter and be tested on it and pass before they can graduate high school. What's your chapter gonna be about? Oh jeez. Let's see. My chapter would be I think it has to be nutrition. Okay. Like actually good nutrition because we are, if you think about a human being, we are biochemistry. And if you aren't supplying your body with the, what it needs to operate well, like there's so many things that, re, that stem from that. And I, th and we need to, like the government has gotten wrong nutrition for so long. Right. I mean, every every twenty years, like, oh yeah, I guess eating like low fat was actually giving everybody like diabetes. So that's oops. I think if we had a chapter on real, legitimate nutritional sciences, that would have the greatest positive impact on our, like, in the world. No, I that that, that would be amazing. 
I, I think that's that would be probably one of the best chapters I've heard recommended uh, so far, just because it's such a systemic problem in all of the U.S. Oh, yeah. Did you see that green shake I was drinking earlier? Uh, no, I didn't see it. Uh, I, so I, I actually... Uh, got this recipe from the, from Anthony Gustin, the guy I wrote the book with. He's a, he's very much more into nutrition than I am, but it's a, I drink this every morning. So it's uh, ice water, a ton of spinach, uh, four raw eggs, a scoop of, um, vanilla, uh, beef protein powder and, uh, walnuts, half a can of coconut milk and an avocado and blueberries. So every morning, like that's really high fat. Yeah, very high fat. Sounds good though. So I, yeah, it's fantastic. It's very high fat, but you need fat. Yeah. And uh, it it makes you very satiated, so you don't overeat throughout the day, and you can stay very mentally focused. So that was my. Uh, I think <laughs> if if you're trying to push hard and grow a business and do those types of things, you have to be fueling yourself well. You need to be fueling yourself well. You need to be recovering well. You need to be hydrating so that you can perform at your highest level. If you don't have those things in line, it makes it such an an uphill battle, more than it needs to be. Yeah, I think it's one of those um, kind of unwritten rules, like things you don't notice until after the fact, like if you're just going through, like it's very similar to fitness. Like if you're extremely conditioned and then you're like, but say you don't practice for like hiking, you're just like a really conditioned athlete. And then someone wants to take you on a four hour hike. And at the end of the hike, you, you never really thought about how uncomfortable it was or anything like that. You just kind of got through the hike and Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're good to go because you're a conditioned human being. I feel like that nutrition is like that in life. Like if you're, (laughs) if, if, if you're really like, if you're eating really healthy, you're just like going through your day. You don't like you don't get like super tired or like worn out and like all of these things. It's once your nutrition's really crappy, you start to have all these problems and you're just like struggling with day-to-day life. And it's just because your nutrition is so out of whack and you're trying every other thing to fix it, but it's most likely the nutrition. And I think that shake you mentioned is probably a fantastic start for everyone to, to, to start their day with. Yeah. Just as long as you're okay with like a one in a million chance of salmonella from the raw eggs. But, um, yeah, I was wondering if I was like, (laughs) Okay, I, I haven't had yeah. I haven't had any problems yet, but I mean, worst comes to worst, it's like just it's like one day of diarrhea, and I'll take that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that risk. I'm I'm okay with that risk. That's awesome. The other the other thing I was going to mention too is think about this: all of your cells replicate. Your skin cells replicate. Your bones, everything replicates. So we're constantly churning over cells. Well, what the hell do you make those cells out of? You make them out of what you eat. So if you're eating junk like do you want to be building yourself out of junk material i don't i want to be building myself out of the best possible blocks if you will yeah so it's quite literally you are what you eat uh, literally you're yeah you're building yourself out of the things that you eat you're fueling yourself from the things you eat Uh, all the chemical reactions in the body, you know, there's enzymes that are required. There's vitamins that are required for those reactions to run well. Well, where do those things come from? They come from eating. So if you're eating poorly, there's literally, you're having suboptimal biochemistry. Yeah, man. So let's talk about shift back to business now. So I think we talked about, you know, kind of, uh, the movement fix and we kind of mentioned the daily domination journal um what other projects are you working on <laughs> so um some of them are around business some of them are around the movement fix uh so one of the other projects that i currently have that's currently live is movementproviders.com which i mentioned earlier and movement providers is a free place for healthcare and fitness professionals to well, anybody who works with other human beings in the in the field of like health and fitness should be, in our opinion, listed on the site. It's a resource. So if someone asks you, hey, do you know someone in this city that I could go see? Uh, how do you know? You'd have to look at Google or you'd have to look at Yelp. And that's always just not the best. So instead, we Anthony and I made the site so that uh, we could answer that question and make it very easy for people to connect and find good people. 
So that that's a project we are currently growing the user or the the number of listings on the site. So the more people that are listed, the more useful it becomes for everybody. So hopefully, uh, any listeners of this podcast will decide to list themselves. And additionally, for the movement fix, I just actually finished a project and it goes live tomorrow. And uh, it's a uh, it's a course, an online course for trainers, coaches, and clinicians on how to modify workouts when athletes are having pain. So if someone's having shoulder pain, how to know what exercises make sense for them, what things to avoid, what things to do, what accessory work should be done be done uh, for that person. So that actually launches tomorrow, which is what I've been spending a large majority of my time on over the past couple months building that. And I'm also making, which will be released middle of April, a uh, 12-week training program in conjunction with my colleague, Dr. John Russin. And it will be a, a hybrid training program of metabolic conditioning, Olympic lifting, running, and bodybuilding. Then I'm also making a running program, uh, strength training for runners, with my colleague, Chris Johnson, who's a world-renowned physical therapist in the running realm. That'll be probably end of April or May. And then for health fit business, we are making uh, some educational courses for healthcare and fitness professionals on uh, learning good business skills and developing that. So those are the projects that I'm currently working on. Uh, Some are on the fast track, some are on the wayside. Um, so I can focus specifically on the ones I am wanting to get completed right away rather than, as I mentioned earlier, trying to work on them all, which is very hard to do. That sounds like a lot of uh, valuable content. I'm actually pretty interested in the uh, the one about scaling options for people who are in pain. Or Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, uh, that was a – it was – originally filmed as at a live event that I co-taught with um, the other guy that I'm doing it with, Dr. Dan Pope. And we were, uh, we did a uh, closed seminar for a gym's trainers and we filmed it and then turned it into an online course with a lot of additional content. So there's, within that, there's uh, the, the lecture video, uh, which was an eight hour lecture there's a like an ebook that goes along with it and chapter readings uh all an additional video library there's uh, modification and and uh keynote handouts so that literally the modifications of what we would logically go through for somebody are just listed in a flow chart as sort of a quick access type of thing um yeah and that's also going to be something that we continually update so for those who who purchase that course we will be doing updates over time to make it better and refine it. And all of those updates will be forever included. So I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this release for quite some time. Uh, so hopefully it gets the reception that I'm, that I hope it will, because I think that every gym should have a copy of it to train their trainers and coaches. I actually hope that people, um, share their login uh, and that probably, that might sound weird. Like I want a gym to buy it for their gym and let all of their trainers use it. Like I don't want all of their trainers to buy it. I just want it to be a resource for people so that we can, you know, as my mission statement, help people learn how to move their bodies and be pain free. Uh, so I'm kind of hoping that gyms think of it that way. I should probably write that on the sales page. Like, please pirate this. <laughs> yeah. Share it around. <laughs> be, be careful without maybe just a little bit. No. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what I think about that? Cause people ask me that all the time. Like how, how do you make sure that you know, people don't share the login and how do you make sure this and that? I go, do you know game of Thrones is, is the most pirated TV show ever. And it's also the most profitable show ever. Yeah. Or one of the most profitable shows. I just think it's inevitable that if you do things that are worth people trying to like steal it, the sales follow. So I'm not worried about it. And the other thing I don't want to do is make it harder and cumbersome for people to access the course so that I so that the 5% of people who would pirate it can't, but I punish the 95% of people who aren't going to pirate it. Yeah. I don't want to punish the I don't want to punish the majority to worry about a small percentage of people who might do something that quite, quite frankly, doesn't really bother me that much because I know it's, it's pretty insignificant, but I want it to make it, I want the user experience to be fantastic. 
for the people who are purchasing it. I don't. Why would I punish them? Yeah, dude, I think that's uh, user experience is hands down one of the most important things that I try and focus on in in my business, and I think that it's uh, it's really valuable in in keeping people happy. Well, yeah, I mean, there's times too when I was I'm trying to get like back in the day when they were really trying to lock down videos and, and movies and stuff. It's like, man, it is easier to pirate a video than it is to buy a video. Because like you buy it on one computer, then you go up on, a, on an airplane and you try to watch it offline and it lock, it like locks you out because it can't verify it. Right. <laughs> like, like, you're making me want to go pirate it. Yeah, they, they, they do take that a little bit far. Like uh, Apple and stuff, yeah, they, they get a little yeah, bit crazy. Yeah, I'm like, geez Louise, why this is hard. You're making it harder for me than just than doing the wrong thing. So I think it needs to be easier to do the right thing. All right, man, are you ready for the quick fire questions of the show? Yes. All right, so what's the hardest workout you've ever done? Um, the hardest workout I've ever done, I have two. There's a, a CrossFit workout called EVA. I think it's called EVA. And it's like run, it's like five rounds of run 800 meters, do 30 kettlebell swings at 70 pounds, and do 30 pull-ups. And it took me like, this was, I did this in 2008, and I, I almost started crying. <laughs> That's awesome. Like during round four, I just, I stopped at this bench and I went, what am I doing with my life? That was one. The other one was the, um, in the CrossFit open of 2014 and they also repeated it in 2016. It was, uh, tw- I think it was 21, 18, 15, 12, nine, six, three yeah. of nine, 95 pound thrusters and burpees over the bar. The one that gave and everyone I, rhabdo. Yeah. Yeah, I think that probably gave a lot of people rhabdo yeah. in their triceps. Um, I think I had, I think I probably had some issue like that afterwards, but probably very mild. Um, but that was when I did that workout. I said, I'm, I'm never doing that workout. Like that was one of the worst workouts I've ever done. Yeah, that's uh, and the reason I said everyone got rhabdo is because I, I wrote an article on that uh, rhabdo <laughs> in particular. And about a week after that workout was prescribed for the first time, my site traffic exploded. On oh, rhabdo yeah, you, and comments like, were just flooding in of people who got rhabdo from I got rhabdo. I got that rhabdo. workout. And I was like, uh, wow, way to go, Dave Castro. Good job. Everybody got it in their triceps, I think, for that one. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I've had like mild rhabdo like 10 times, but never like bad enough that I would have gone to the hospital. Yeah. That but I, I do wonder frequently how often do we get rhabdo at a, like a very mild, like a really mild level and we just think it's really sore. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it's a sliding scale. Depending on how conditioned you are and whatnot, it's definitely possible, I think. Yeah, not to make light of rhabdo. I mean, nobody should have rab- rhabdo. Yeah, you don't want it. <laughs> it's not good. My wife has had it. been in the hospital, so. Oof. I mean, in your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Uh, yeah. The best. <laughs> yeah, the weekly. Uh, did I mention this earlier? The weekly goals in a day? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Write down your weekly goals and see if you can do them today. All right. I think that's – and then when you feel like stopping, just just Keep don't going. stop. Yeah. Like that's the, the best way to build that toughness is to rep- repeatedly do things you don't want to do. Another way is to do things – like let's say you look at the trash and the trash is full and you need to take it out. We have a certain like resistance to doing things that need to get done. So I try to find ways. How do I decrease my resistance so I do things? So I think about uh, the what are the easy things to do that I'm being resistant to, like making my bed. So I wake up in the morning and I look at my bed and I go, oh, I'll make it later. And I go, don't resist it. Just make it right now. Put your hand on the sheet. Start making it. And over time, that builds some mental toughness and less resistance to doing things that need to get done. Awesome, man. All right, if you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, can I say my own body or is that too? You can definitely say that. My own body because there's more that I can do with my own body than I could do with any tool in my opinion. Perfect, man. And here's the question of the show. What is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? And this is 100% open-ended. Best advice for becoming a better human. This goes back to the eating thing, the nutrition thing. My best advice to being a better human is to focus on eating the right stuff and do that as the majority of your eating. Everything else bases, is based off of that. So if you take care of yourself physically and biochemically, 
with sleep, with good food, and st- drinking enough water, I think that's the best way you can be a better human. Awesome, man. So I know a lot. Of, we've mentioned a lot of your resources uh, on the podcast, and I'll link to all of them in the show notes. But if people listening to this want to learn more about you or your work, where should they check you out? Yeah, right now the best place to see all that stuff is themovementfix.com. And uh, that is my home base website as of now. And uh, Instagram at The Movement Fix is my main account there as well. All right, perfect, Ryan. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being on the Better Humanology podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. always whine about their best.